everybody. Welcome back to Esoteric Atlanta. Of course, my name is Bryce. I am joined here in partnership today with my friend, Hillis. How you doing today, Hillis? I'm good. You know, living in Florida, you know, it's rainy season. So one day it rains, one day it doesn't rain, one day you're flooded, one day, you know, so it is what it is. Sometimes an alligator walks across your front yard. It's whatever. No, <laughs> but I've been having iguanas visit me, you know, every week. Seriously, they come hang out in my window. You know, uh, Florida is like the Australia of America. You know how Australia has so many wild <laughs> animals? That's Florida for us. Like, it, it's that's <laughs> just what, how it is in Florida. It's just, um, you don't want to be around. I heard, the you know how a lot of the, the, the Florida pools have like that big tent around yeah, them? Yeah, the cage, yeah. I've heard it was because of alligators. No, that's uh, that's has to do with legal legality stuff. You, if you have a pool, you it's either one or two things. As if you have, if you live in a household and you have kids, there's this thing called a baby gate. Yeah. So if the baby gate is like maybe about two, three feet high. And you put it around the pool so no kids can you know oh. run the pool. And then the pool cage is just an added measure of security, too, for that. And then also to keep, you know, predators or prey and insects out. I mean, it's, yeah. But honestly, you want to hear something crazy? Last week on the news, I did see on uh, a news story where a Florida panther got in a woman's truck while she was in the grocery store. And she opened that doesn't the door. surprise me. That doesn't Florida. That doesn't surprise me. I mean, listen, man versus nature. Nature's always going to win. If an alligator <laughs> takes over your pool, guess what? It's that alligator's pool now. If a panther gets in your car, guess what? It's that panther's car now. Unless you see a black racer snake, you know. You, I mean, there's black racers, owls, bunnies, uh, iguanas, coyotes. Yep. You know, bears. Lots of bunnies. There's where my uh, boyfriend's family is <laughs> in Sarasota. There are bunnies everywhere. And I'm so glad that my dog is the least coordinated dog in the whole world because I could not handle it if he were to, to catch a bunny and bring a bunny back home. So... Florida, we love yeah. you. It's it's uh you know Florida. We Flor we uh, we still make fun of Florida as kids, but now Florida has turned into the MVP of the United States. It is literally the state of live and let live. You know, like, it is literally like, you know, it's your property. You do you, boo. Um, so, right. so we got we got to applaud Florida for that. So, but anyway, yeah. we're gonna be talking. Speaking of continents and lands and MVPs, you guys, this is what part is this part four? Is there yeah, part, part four. Part? On the lost yeah. continent of Mew, you guys. Right. Um, we've gotten such a positive response to this, Hillis. Um, I'm going to be, of course, including all of our past episodes in the description box below in case you missed any of those. And, of course, our last episode we did with our friend Jessica Jones, who is a remote viewer, which was pretty cool because she never knows what she's viewing, right? Yeah. We targets. Yeah, we have to do another. I want to do another show with her because one of the things that she talked about and we talked about it after we got done recording is the white coat. And then I, then it hit me, you know, being a psychic guy, you know, just being in Jessica's presence and just receiving this information after we stopped recording. It was like, duh, it's not a lab coat, it's a tunic. Yep. Yep. And so, you know, it, it, so I want to go back and, and revisit that because I, I feel that that tells a lot of tale but today i'm really excited because in the fourth part four in the book uh titled the children of move by james stoke what it really goes into the the different civilizations the different cultures and how things began you know yeah. and and in his research and i thought it was really interesting too and then i'm reading um the cosmic forces of move part one and this also kind of ties in into the science of Mu and the science of, of how things happened. That there was one thing that really struck me in reading in reading this book, the Cosmic Forces Part One, that people who follow me, people who know me, know I do light language and I create light language symbols. There was a symbol in this one book that I drew a couple of years ago, and it was like. <gasps> 
And so, you know, which we have you, like, talked about that episode. Handling that, or was that like a past life memory, or? Uh, it was both, but we'll get into more of that in the next episode. <laughs> so now, well, for, okay, so for so for Hillis, if we have people that are like just now clicking on this, just a quick yeah. recap, like just a Cliff Notes version, like what was Mew or what is Mew? So, Mew is the lost continent that is stretched from the Hawaii chain of islands all the way across to the Polynesian islands. That's the, you know, north, I'm sorry, not north, uh, east and west. And then as far south as um, Easter Island. So that's how far south it went. Now, I forget how north it goes, but it's this ma a large continent that existed over approximately 75,000 years ago and inhabited up to 10 million people at one point. And I believe there will be a, a, a correction to that as we go through this particular book with James Churchward. And James Churchward is the one who, at the time, was a billionaire who funded his own research to understand where the lost continent and move and where the origins of humanity really began. And it just, when you read his books and the symbology and the heretic alphabet, the heretic language, you then begin to understand the origin of things and how things really started and how information was uh, disseminated across the multiple continents, the multiple countries on the planet. And I feel it's important to know that. And one who's always been fascinated with the origin of things and been fascinated with where things come from, this is really right up my alley. Because, you know, being a poet and studying words and studying this and just really understanding the origin of man, I mean, this is a big deal. I mean, I, and I've never been one to uh, really dive into history. But with the work that I do as a Syrian Lemoyer light energy practitioner, it's really piqued my interest because, you know, and especially also having visions and past life memories. It's like, where is this coming from? Where is this under, you know? <laughs> so it's just like all in my head right now, but it just really gives validation to what it is. I mean, yes, there's, you know, the Book of the Dead and all these Egyptian books, the Law of One and all these other books, but where did all that information come from? Yeah. You know? And, and so, because most, and the thing is, most of everything that was discovered in Egypt was already established. Right. It already had Where they get their ideas from. Where right, did that exactly. And exactly. that's the thing, just for people who are new, like, this is like, this is what we call alternative history, because this definitely debunks what you learn in school about, like, evolution. Oh, yeah. Like, this is not... You know, um, this kind of goes along the lines of Atlantis and Lumeria and like all these different civilizations that have been labeled by the establishment as legend or as just as right. like, story, like, you know, that that didn't really exist. But we know that no, nothing comes right. from that. like you can't take something from nothing like these actually this is an alternative right. history. And, you know, my big question is with my channel and all the deep diving I've done, Hillis, it's like, why would they hide this from us? Like, why? Right. And right. I think we know why. I think we know well, why. Because it's oh, divided, wow. because, because also, too, if you guys go back and watch episode three we did with Jessica, it was just confirmation of that move was the Garden of Eden. And what I found fascinating, too, is that the other day, I'm not, I'm not going to give any names or, or give any channels, but I was listening to uh, someone I regularly listen to on YouTube. Well, actually, they don't have a YouTube channel anymore. They got banned from YouTube, so now they just are humble because of information like this. Yeah. And so uh, she was doing an interview with this individual, and these two individuals were in the Philippines. And they lived from there. They were born there. They talk about, you know, the alternative history as we did and, and how some of that information, uh, is, you know, kept secret in the Philippines. The Philippines has a, has an abundance of secret information. And they talked about, and now he said, mom, and I'm like, no, that can't be right. But he may have been using it in code or whatnot. I don't know. But yeah, he talked about how this particular, land and uh, we just and we know that 
the Polynesian islands where the Philippines are was connected to Mu. And yeah. he talked about how that was the original the Garden of Eden. Because if you do, uh, and I think he talked about something about a, a DNA test on some of the people there that were direct descendants, you know, they have uh, DNA traces all the way back to the Garden of Eden. I found that fascinating. I'm like, okay. That is really fascinating. And yeah, guys, I will remind you, we're going to put this on YouTube, but just be careful in the comment section with certain words that you use because, uh, you know, there it, it's a catch-22, isn't it, Hillis? Like, when yeah. you deal with with the banning, you know you're saying something right. So you get its validation, but then yeah. you also have the banning to deal with. And um, I think one of the most, con I know we're going to talk, get into like the descendants of me, the children of me. So like, this, like how, yeah. all, how we, how, why we're here. Cause we're all children right. of me, right? We're all right. descendants of you. Um, right. And one of the most fascinating things that I, when we first, when I read the first book, we talked about this because we've been conditioned to believe in school. And again, I said this in our episode, it doesn't, you know, all human life is valuable. Right. It's like yeah. as Billy, as our, as our, one of our, both of our mutual, one of our favorite podcasters, Billy Carls, uh, Carlson, it says is Carson, excuse me, says if one person in this world is enslaved, we're in trouble. Like it doesn't matter, you know, as far as like every race is valuable. We, we know that on this channel, but yeah. um, we've been conditioned and programmed through our education to believe that every, every human being comes from Africa and we were all black and yeah. turned in different races. But in this research, he, it, the exact opposite isn't it yeah it, it is and the thing is and and i and i get into that now because the reason why in my opinion that we were taught that africa is the motherland because one is the existing continent two there's proof that dates back all the way to the beginnings of egypt of man establishing you know the upper egypt and lower egypt and so they said, well, that's proof enough for me. This is where man has come from because of the colony that Mu established in Egypt. But right. then, you know, if you go back even more, Egypt was the colony of Atlantis, which is another sunken landmass that was by, according to James Churchward, the landmass that was off to the west of Africa. And when the landmass sunk, we got the Amazon because at the time the Amazon was just a giant swamp. Yeah. It was marshlands. But when we lost Atlantis, it sunk. And then all that water rushed into that spot to fill that hole. And so we have these, these, things on the planet, these instances that can't be ignored when we don't do our own research. And that's what this is about. It's about us really understanding, you know, not just the origins of humanity, but the origins of religion, the origins of life, origins of everything. You know, it all started with, you know, and with the the snake and the cosmic eggs, if you will. So you know, we talked I want to, in the missing books of the Bible, they talk a lot about the cosmic egg and then Gnosticism, that's the Gnostics were. So where, where was that coming from? And that's what, you know, it's like, so where did the African colonies we find come from? They all had, they all had to come from somewhere. Unfortunately though, this Mew is under the Pacific ocean, right? right. So, um, and so according to what Jessica said, I could have slid down into uh, Antarctica down south because yeah. as I explained, when you have tectonic plates, they shift and move and, you know, shift and drop off and move and shift. It could have, over the course of 70,000 years, could have shifted down to uh, Antarctica. So, Which is I mean, why it's so blocked, you know, because we're talking about incredible technology. We're talking about, you know, the, the, the civilization, new things that we don't know. And, and that's kind of, Hillis, like, that's the beauty, I think, of this story of Mew is that, even though I do believe we have intervention from extraterrestrials as well, I think yeah. that comes into the story. But as far as like all like here on, we're all Earthlings, right? Like let's take race out of it. We're all Earthlings, yeah. we're all from yeah. this planet, and we all have a <laughs> origin story here on planet. Like, listen, I think if side note, so, if so we, I'm excited too yeah. to really get into this. 
If we did, my, my thing is like, if we did have an alien invasion, I think that would end like racism right away because I think all of a sudden people on this earth would be like, wait a minute, we're earthlings. Like, we're all like, well, I think we're have a yeah, common, exactly. Exactly. We would have a common enemy. Like, this is our earth. Like, get out of here. But um, anyway, so I'm going to hand it over to you. Hey, listen, <laughs> like, you just, I'm going to put the camera on you and let you just go. Just tell <laughs> educate our friends on oh, no don't put the camera completely on me i want to see you too oh okay okay i always feel bad <laughs> when, the, when i want someone to like be the star when i like have them on the camera and, tell <laughs> and, I, and again guys just so you guys know we got to give a little bit of respect again to james churchwood because to me his story is almost as fascinating as his research yeah he really exactly. went through hell didn't he hillis yeah he did he did, and and let's kind of let's jump on into it because you have to understand that the continent, the sunken continent of Mu, one time inhabited ten million people. Just to give you you context, Mu was about the size of Australia. Just to give you guys reference, and it was divided up into three sections. 10 tribes so the so guys have context this was like 70,000 years ago kind of like different states almost yeah pretty much i mean well it had to be i mean you have this you know and and i guess i use the word tribes because there was no separation everything right. was shared everything was once so they just you know you know shared amongst each other but just to give you context you know this was confirmed in the tablets and just so you guys know, i'm going to be doing a lot of reading for beta so that we guys can have you know put our understanding of what was researched and i will of course be adding in you know things from my opinion and from previous readings but it was confirmed that through the tablets and artifacts that were found you know that were found across the globe you know this was found in india china burma tibet uh cambodia the yucatan Central America, specific, uh, Pacific Islands, which are colonies of Mu, including Egypt and Atlantis, you know, which was not talked about here. But you have to understand that these were colonies, and the reason why they established these colonies is because the continent, the people, were multiplying, so they had to have somewhere to go. And so through their travels, and any, and I know I said, mentioned this on other uh, iterations, other parts. So anyone, any person who left Mu was Mayan. Yeah. Didn't matter if they went to South America, North America, India, China, doesn't matter where they went in the planet, they were considered Mayans. And that's because they left the, the motherland, they left the empire. And so anything that was established was called the colony empire and anyone who saw over that particular colony the overseers were called um during the colony empires or i forget what the other term used because the the person the emperor of mu was called mu Ra, meaning that they were the son the emperor of all the lands so what they said went and you have to understand that after Mu sunk, and in my readings, I also discovered that the some of the colonies that were in South America and in the Yucatan at the same time, Mu was experiencing the cataclysms, you know, the earthquakes and such, was some of the colonies. Yeah. So you know, with the rising of the Andes and the villas and the valleys being sunken and all the stuff that's, that's happening. Important. So uh, for our audience who are new to this, the 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 terrain of the earth was not what it is now. No, it was completely flat. Created like the Appalachian, the Andes, the Pier, like all these different mountain chains that we know now were created at this moment of the the plate shifting, which destroyed Mu. Right, right. So yeah, if you guys go back to part two, where we really get into the gas belt and, you know, which was how Mu was destroyed as well as the rising of the mountains, which also decimated some of the colonies that were present. And so with the colonies being present, you have to understand that they were great sailors. They, they were great navigators. 
So you have to understand the way that the colonies were established. And so, you know, and I always go back to uh, Japan and their flag, which is the symbol of Mu, because in the center you have the red sun with eight rays, or is it seven? Which is, uh, each ray is also uh, establishment of each colony. And so the, the name given to Japan is the land of the rising sun. Yep. And the land of the rising sun was Mu, because Mu was off to the east. And the sun always comes up in the east, and that was the motherland. So they were giving their uh, honor or their, you know, whatever to Mu, because that was the motherland. And so anytime when people left the motherland, they went one or two ways. They went down south under Mu to South America. And from South America, they traveled through the valley. And this is at the time when there was mostly swamps. So this was when Atlantis was still in existence. So you can travel through South America, through the Amazon basin, through all the, the rivers that way to get up to Atlantis to get to Upper Egypt, okay? Mm -hmm. And then from Upper Egypt, you get to uh, Tibet, India, but you get to that region. And then the other way was to go down and go to the West, which you would go to uh, Japan, China, Lower Asia. You will go that way, and then you end up in Lower Egypt. But the people of venture from Lower Egypt merged and went up to higher Egypt and then, you know, the schooling and the teachings because of the inspired writings of Mu were all gathered in Tibet and India in that one place, which is why, you know, and we'll get into that in a moment, which is why Jesus went there for 12 years to learn everything that he wanted to learn. And that's where James Churchwood's journey started was in India. When he yeah, found exactly. these these tablets that and guys, that's all all those again, all those videos are down in the description box below. So if you want more information, you can go back and rewatch those videos or look up the books online. Um James Churchwood, he has multiple books on his research into this lost history. Yes, exactly. And and one of the the more established or more of the, the stories that people often talk about are the I always mispronounce this word is that case coaddles, you know, the the people, the the you know, the people, the dragons. And so this particular colony had fifty thousand people of America. Just imagine a colony that size. And so they were pretty much almost like the second city of Mu, if you will. And, you know, in 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 the moment when to get into, you know, the skin tones and textures and things like that. But you have to understand that each colony uh, began to establish its own uh, regulations, own rules, own rituals, own own uh, significance because of where they lived, even though everything was still connected to Mu. But when Mu fell, they kind of had to fend for themselves because it wasn't anything that they could really, really uh, connect or tie to. Uh, because it was more so the, uh, where is it, 16,000 years ago, approximately, this is when that colony fell because of the gas bills, because of that particular empire. So you have to really understand that each colony had its own well, on significance, but what is fascinating about this is the fact that all Mu, Mayan, or South American, and Egyptian writings, and when I say this, writings, also the Mu heretic alphabet, very similar. And what I find very fascinating, especially in Asian culture, I don't know if you know this or not, that they don't use the letters R or L in their language, and neither did Mu. Oh, interesting. Neither did Egypt. Yeah. And so, which gives credence that they still have most of the old ways. Yeah. Yeah. And I will say, I will remind people the word heretic, I think that we get triggered by that word sometimes. And I talked about this with the missing books of the Bible. 
the word heretic all that means you guys is is it just basically isn't the mainstream narrative that's what heretic means so for any of you guys that so when we talk about a heretic alphabet or heretical alphabet that's just an alphabet that's not recognized by the mainstream alphabets of the world when we talk about so all you all y'all out there as we say in the south all y'all who have pushed back against the mainstream if anything are technically heretics in that sense that you are following a path that is not approved by the mainstream if that makes sense does that make sense hillis that's yeah that it does and that's exactly that what word. it is yeah that's exactly what it is and there's and I, I just thought of one thing i want to share hopefully i can find it because i don't have it marked before i get into this is uh that all the cosmic sciences that we talk about all the religions that we talk about and one of the things that always go back to my mind is how a child especially in catholic school i was always taught that you have to keep religion and state separate or religion separate from the so you have to keep religion out of everything okay except i was in catholic school so it's like okay religion and everything you know so it's kind of like an oxymoron but you have to like really understand that you know since they understood the science of nature the science of the stars they were far more advanced mm -hmm. than what we are today oh yeah imagine yeah. imagine that you know they didn't have all these distractions didn't have this or that they were far more advanced than than us and the and the proof of that is that one that they didn't have a use of the word for god and they talk about their deity and i want to read this to you verbatim and it says here on page 36 in the children of mu it says the origin of the word of god and this is very important to understand as i read this and it says in all very ancient writing one comes across the word god it reads the god this the god that generally we find the name given to such god as we generally we find the name given to the god such as the chaldean the god Bela marduk the egyptian the god thoth etc the ancients did not refer to the creator to them he was supreme their god meaning was the cosmic forces originating with the creator even goes on to even further say in the ancient writings we consistently come across the marriage of god and goddess who produce the who produce or accomplish something the ancients knew perfectly well that to create something two cosmic forces were involved and i'm just going to end it there and so in the essence of when they speak of god and, and one who is of spiritual nature like myself and like you we understand you know god is you know cosmic god is beyond that and so when we have in the religious text you know they refer to god as someone like uh, such as thought you know and being a god or a deity in that regard but god was not referred to as the as god as we call god because in mu and this goes back to the first part where we where i talked about the uh, symbology and symbology of the circle mm -hmm. and the circle was created for them to have a simple check for them to focus on and actually that's even but in my TikTok, i even talk about this in the sacred symbols uh part one in the series of many videos i'm doing as well you guys can really understand the true meaning and purpose of the circle and that was for them the, the people of mu to give them some, something to focus on when they have the thought of god or when they think of the creator or the cosmic forces in in that essence in that sense and that's essentially what it is you know Andristi, yeah and Andristi can be a form of it's interesting reading this as well because in um in in the yoga world the the chanting of om um, we say Om, but it's actually A U M, and the and Patel yes. talks yeah. about that in the Yoga Sutras, where that's the name of God because Aum A U M has no beginning and end. It's a constant cosmic uh, a source of creation, which is like the circle, right? It's never ending. It's never beginning. 
Um, yes, so that, exactly. that, that's very reminiscent of what, um, from Patanjali's uh, writings 5,000 years ago to what we're seeing with what James Churchwood found in his discoveries of this lost, um, lost empire. Yes, and I'm going to read a couple of more things out of here because I feel it's very important to understand. Is that later in the history of man of souls, and this is on page 37, Bryce, okay. uh, man of souls, man thereafter left his material body was added to the list of God, such as the Egyptian thought, God of learning. This was not out of place, for the ancients knew perfectly well that man and his perfect creation was given cosmic forces, meaning that once you, and, and this is where the symbol of the ump comes in at, if you guys understand what that means, and of course we can get into that uh, at a later time. But it even goes on to say that the cosmic forces, these forces are under the control of the soul, that when the soul left the material body, it carried the cosmic forces with it. So the soul of the man possessing cosmic forces were appropriately added to the list of gods. So meaning that they, anyone who carried the cosmic forces or understood the cosmic forces in their spirit, they were called a god. Now, yeah, in you were the sense of a, right, exactly, like light yeah. or deity, exactly. Yeah, I like how he says um, are under control of the soul, and I talk about that a lot on my channel because that's again, that's the whole Yoga Sutras. It's like we get uh, Patanjali says that you know man gets stuck in a karmic loop because man thinks his identity is his soul when his soul is not his identity the identity is just the creation of the soul and so when you achieve enlightenment and you you understand that and deeply understand that you reach so that's what that means to me is they're saying like thought these char characters will say i think they really lived um they reached a place of like enlightenment of understanding like Patanjali also has that same title given to him as well. So that makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah. And it even says the earliest of these applications, which I can find in the Bible where deity is called God and Lord God, since, uh, since it has been, uh, <laughs> since then has become his most popular name. And so it is because of the possession of these cosmic forces. And what are cosmic forces? Uh, they are uh, the elemental energies, life force energy, which I'll get more into in the next part of this. Because I'm reading all about the cosmic forces, y'all, and it is... It gets into the body, too, with, with the, the chakra system and the values and the body that as above, so below. Yeah, it's... it's yeah. Yeah, and there was, I was trying, and uh, for whatever reason, I have it written down in my notes. I can't find this one particular entry. Maybe I mislabeled it because it, it well, I'll just read from my notes. It just says, it mentioned that God, or not God, Jesus, understood the cosmic forces when he performed the miracle of walking on water. Love it, so in order... Right, and so and is so. This is why Jesus can be called a god or a master because he understood the elements of the presence of these cosmic forces, and he held them in his body because he was in Tibet for twelve years, where the inspired writings of Mu were held for anyone to learn. <laughs> right. Well, now I want the people who come from a Christian background to consider that when you hear the story of him walking on water that's levitation right i think sometimes yes. in the christian faith there's this disconnect between eastern philosophy where you hear about levitation and christianity what he was doing walking on water is the exact same thing that yoga people for centuries have been uh, achieving through their own study of their own cosmic energy it's levitation yes exactly and so one of the things that we have to really give credence to is really understanding you know, the origin of faith, the origin of religion, the origin of all these things and how it trickled down into the colonies because they were colonies of Mu, they had to abide by the rulings of the Mu Ra, the emperor of the motherland of Mu. So what they said went. But after it descended into the ocean, 
and then, you know, have to reestablish itself in Atlantis through other colonies. And then Egypt became almost like the law of the land, you know, years later because of Thoth, because of all these other gods, these other deities, these, these because of these cosmic sciences. But it, what fascinates me about all of this is how this information moved through South America, moved through Egypt, and even into the name of the Inca Empire. What I found fascinating about the Inca Empire was the fact that the Incas, which is what we call them, was not their, their name. Inca meant king. Interesting. Yeah. And the people were the Kashwas. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So, I mean, the the people of Keshwa who were Mayan migrated to Peru, to South America in that space. And the and Inca meant king. So I was fascinated by this because you have these land and these ancient uh, uh, archaeologists who dig. It's like, oh, yeah, the Incas, this, the Incas, that. Well, there was only one Inca. He was the king of the Keshwas. And so... It is in that space, and I actually give you a, a a snippet of this, you know, where it says the influx of the Kitches into Peru was of a friendly character, just as Europeans come to the United States today. Among them, and in the Inca Empire, was not prehistoric, nor can it be claimed as such. It was formed by highly civilized people who had been shut in and unknown to the outer world for hundreds of years until the Spaniards arrived. And then the dynasty, and I'm looking for the exit to where it actually says that the, there it is. Uh, find, I'm sorry, I'm just like skipping ahead. I'm on page 83, uh, where it says, finding himself with child, he went to live on one of the islands of Lake Titicaca to hide until her shame until her son has reached manhood. Then she became, then she came ashore, presented him to the world, to the people, and being of divine conception, he became their king. And so this is of the Inca people. And so, or what we call Inca people. And have you so, heard of this? No, I have not. So I'm initiated from the Muna Key. These are the Muna Key rites. I've been initiated into the Muna Key rites. My friend Cindy, who comes on my channel, we should actually do a show with Cindy because she's Peruvian. And um, when you said that, because look how it's spelled, Muna Key, the yeah. rites of the Incas. And so this it this took a while for me to be initiated in all the different steps. Um, yeah. But it comes down from the Andes Mountains. And I was I was seeing if I had a book on it. Um, because my friend Cindy, again, she is Peruvian, so that I got initiated before I even got the book, um, and yeah. the, the rituals and stuff together. But it makes me wonder if the Muna Key writes. I even have my my medicine pouch here from yeah. my initiation into the Muna Key writes, and um, and so I'm now thinking this is also probably coming from Mu. Yeah, and what's even more fascinating about this, I'm just gonna skip ahead a little bit because of you know people often talk about skin color and you know why we are the way that we are and you know why do we have our features the way that we have our features and so this section that he talked about pretty much defines that and it, it's a lot <laughs> so uh Give me one second here, looking for... Greeks, I mean, this is everyone, right? This is not even... I mean, even if you look at, like, European cultures, like, ancient European cultures that the church labels as pagans, it's very much in line with a lot of the other ancient civilizations, like Egypt what they were doing they might have called had different names for different things they were doing but they were pretty much the same the same type of rituals exactly and that's what that's what i love about this and 
I'm looking. See, this is this is why I should invest in a couple of highlighters when I do this, as opposed yeah. to just writing notes. Because I'm looking for the purpose specifically talked about skin color, but I can recall part of it. Highlighters are amazing. <laughs> These are all my notes and <laughs> for my shows. Um, <laughs> but I can recall part of it, and part of the. And mind you. You have a landmass approximately the size of Australia, 10 million people living in 10 different tribes. And part of their skin coloration, and it has to do with what they eat and how yeah. they eat. Mm -hmm. And so this is where we get the rainbow people mm -hmm. huh, because of, of what they ate. And I want to see is this it. Uh, and now, to me, comes the most fascinating part of South American history, the distant part, strange that it may be, appear today. The fact remains the ancient times of South America played an important role in peopling the world. Now, for it was a passageway to the important uh, lines of the colonists took. We talked about that already. Where is it? <laughs> I want to read it. I am baby. so now. I'm like I'm like I feel like I'm like my spine's tingling from the moon I key rides. I cannot wait to text my friend Cindy when we're done. I'm gonna see if she'll do a show with us because I'm like this is definitely coming from Mew. This yeah. is where this is where they got the Peruvians because she comes again, guys. Right. Cindy comes from a line of Peruvian shaman, um, and yeah. I'm actually you know when you look at let me actually pull up. Let's see. Let's sacred. She uh, owns Sacred Garden Yoga. So this is Cindy, you guys. I want you guys to see because I know what you're talking about with the different races. Even within continents, we have different. Because that's, yeah. that's Cindy. You know, yeah. um, there's me with Cindy. <laughs> um, so um, yeah, so you see Cindy. She's very Peruvian, but she's got a lot of like what we would call white features too. So when you talk about the array of the colors of the rainbow, even within specific races. You have yeah, there's a variation. Yeah, yeah. Because, and the thing is, you have to understand that with the first people, of course, you know, over time, with what they ate, their diet, et cetera, it would affect them, you know, just like us. Yeah. But not to the degree that it would have for them because they probably ate more natural stuff than us eating, you know, garbage that we eat today. But, you know, that's a whole other story. But what I was really, 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 really fascinated with is this section here. Uh, where we talk about, uh, and this ju this just floored me. So I'm going to preface this by saying that anyone who is of African descent, all that I'm about to read, you just have to sit down and just allow it, and whatever preconceived notions that you have about the N word or this word or any other word let that go out the window because yes there's we were taught that we come from the motherland africa that we were egyptian we were kings and queens and all of that is true to some degree however i was me being of african descent was floored shocked to a degree when i read this so i'm going to read this all in part so take Take a deep time breath. To hear Take a deep breath. The words. <laughs> and so the ancient Amazon route, two of the most puzzling questions I've had to solve, to be in the slightest bit satisfied with my work, was to tell how Negroes got to be Atlantans or got to Atlantans and how Negroes got to Africa. Two facts had to be faced. Fact one, all Earth was peopled from Mu. We know that. Yeah. Who were all the same race, right? In the beginning, they were all the same race. They were all yes. like a white, olive-skinned... And, and like, our skin tone changed because of the food that we ate. Every tribe began to skin colorization, different features began to change over time because of what they ate. And keep in mind, this civilization existed 70,000 years ago. 
So Fair. we were no. all, so beginning point Mew, we all had the same kind of feature, same skin color, like a variation, like a, like a, I, when I, he described it somewhat like an, an Italian person, like all of skin, dark eyes, dark hair. Yep. And yep. then we started to dispersing over different places. And especially after the plate shift. Well, not even, not even, no, this all happened on Mew before, oh. before okay. people even left. So okay. The colorization and the character and yeah, the yeah, characteristics yeah. were happening while people were still on them. And so then fact two is the home of the Negro in the motherland was the most southwest corner of Mu, which is now represented by a cluster of islands called the Melanesian Islands. And here today, Negroes are uh, descendants of those who saved, who were saved when Mu was in Gulf. The Tibetan tablet answers the questions the inhabitants of the, and I guess is the word where melanin comes from. Yep, is Islands. Because the Melanesian island proved it. We first, we must first differentiate between the two typical black skinned races. So people always talk about people of color, brown skin, dark skin, whatever, right? So, yeah, you can this see all this. This is giving me chill bumps. So this is, the Melanesian Islands are near Australia. Like they're, they're in, like right here's Australia, here they are. And look, yeah. I've never even thought to look at the people of these yeah. islands. Yeah, look they're at not, them. They're not traditionally black like you would see in Africa. No. Maybe that's that, why they also got the idea for the House of Dragons. I mean, come on. Black yeah. people, blonde hair. I mean, come on. I mean, this is, this is wild. Like, look at this. Yeah. This, yeah. Is a, this is a, these are white features on, this is a combination of what we yeah. see. This is wild, Hillis. Yeah, exactly. Look at her. So, like, she's the yeah. combination. This, this girl right here, she looks beautiful. like a, a hardcore, beautiful, hardcore combination of both black and white. That's what she looks like to me is combining a yeah. both. Exactly. And so you have to now you have to differentiate between the two races of black skinned people of Africa. Okay, so the first um the first is the black skinned Grecian favorite straight haired Ethiopian. He's not a Negro, he's a Tamil who first settled in the lower part of India, yeah. which yeah. he yeah. called Dravida. He came from the motherland to India via the Malay Islands, and then from India to the East Africa, and he called the settlements East Africa, Ethiopia, and himself became known Ethiopian. There are Hindus Record yeah. stating that companies of Tamils from southern India migrated from India to the great land in the west. They settled and became the great nation. For, can we just point out how beautiful this girl is? Yeah. Look at that. Look at that hair. Yeah. Dude, so I'm this is why it's important to really understand where we come from, you know? And look at this, yeah. Ellis. Look at this dress right here. What does that yeah, have to remind you of? But what does Africa. that also remind you of? The way they're dressed. The Native Americans. Oh yeah. That, oh yeah. This is Come on. this is look, I'm gonna I'm gonna include this blog, you guys. I haven't read it, but this is where all these pictures are coming from. I'm gonna include this blog in the description box below so you guys can because this is like giving me chill bumps. This is this girl is freaking gorgeous. Whoever this girl is, she needs a modeling contract. Like <laughs> she's, look at her. Like she's right. gorgeous. All right. And so now we go into the second uh black skin, the description of the second black skin. So the first one was more Indian type yeah. with the an Ethiopian type people. But now the second the sec the black skin, kiki hair, flat nose, thick, thick lips, coarse featured Negro is pure. Okay, so the original home of the this Negro, the, the Tamil, because uh, this is this is very oh, yeah. this is where I when I am in India, this is what I'm very familiar with this. Okay, this, yeah. So, yeah. So, so yeah, the Tamil. Okay. 
so people yeah. have a point of reference. Thank you for that. <laughs> all right, now so let's that, go to the next group. So yeah, I'll go back and start all over again. So <laughs> the second is the black skin, kinky hair, flat nose, thick lips, coarse featured Negro pure. So the more common African Americans are pure Negroes, and is what they're saying. The original home of the Negro, where he was given the black skin and developed his coarse features, was in the southwest corner of Mu, the Bismarck Islands, the Solomon Islands, the New Hebrides, and Intermediate Islands are his home today. Here are the descendants of the pure Negroes and the worst savages among the islands. And when I speak of savages, I'm not talking about what we talked about in part two, where we talked about the cannibalists in Boma. They right. were savage and cannibalistic. They speak of them just being savage, being very aggressive, very protective when they refer to the term savage here. So, you know, that was the only word that you could really put right. in. Right. That makes sense to me. It's like a multifaceted word. And then, kill and right. so, but, you know, I'm seeing my own like programming with education because in my mind, when I think of all these yeah. islands around Australia, I think of like Polynesian Asian people. And the fact that, so basically what, what James Church, what is saying that these different groups of ethnically black people didn't originate in Africa. They originated from other places and went, ended up in Africa. Is that correct? Correct. And so, and how they got there is since they were on the southwest corner of Mu, which is closest to Australia, Yep. they they went that path through to India, which is how he talked about how the Tamils ended up in India. Yep. And then the other ones went further west to, I'm sorry, no, that's where the Tamils, so the, the, ne the pure Negroes, they went the other direction. They went through that, through uh, South America, through the uh, Amazon River, out to out in one way and out of South America, and they ended up in Atlantis. And yeah, that's how they got to Egypt is from Atlantis. So that's how they got there. So when you understand the path in which everyone took, you understand how people got there and went. That's why I say it's very important to really understand know how this was and, and how it was set up and even goes into uh how atlantis was survived and how poseidon was not a myth but of atlantis he was actually a king yeah so, so yeah so people so a lot of people think that he's uh a god uh uh, uh a god, uh, but he was just an god. Yeah, he was a great Roman yeah. god. Yeah. yeah, but he was actually the king, one of the kings of Atlantis. And so, you know, when the information is put up in such a way where it's fantasized, people don't tend to, to, to believe it in, in such a way. And so, what is really understood about all of this is that, you know, even when the first people settled into Europe, they were the Keshwa people, the Quetzalcoatl people, they landed in Scandinavia. So, I mean, you have all these people, you know, that went everywhere because of the land and how it, how it was being overpopulated. And, and so they set out to have other colonies because of the overpopulation of their land. They had to make suburbs so elsewhere. Well, right, and it, exactly. so Hillis, I have a question for you. Since finding all this out, because I know you have some white in you as well, what do you think right. with your African, we'll, we'll just say African for lack of a better word, where yeah. do you think your African roots came from? Which part of Mew? Honestly, I'll say, honestly, Southwest corner, because look at my nose, look at my lips. Come on. <laughs> you know, flat nose, big lips. I mean, uh, I mean. What's that? Listen, people pay a lot of money for big lips nowadays. So <laughs> you know, you know what's so funny? And for a while, when I was a kid, I was kind of like ashamed of them because as a kid, I was made fun of for having big lips. I'm like, oh, people pay so much big. money. Oh. People say pay so much money. Well, it's interesting because I know there's a part about the Greek. Are we going to get to the Greek? 
or do you want to wait for men or yeah we can we can wait because one of the things i went i when i left the section uh of the greeks it wasn't much history involved there. it was just like a, a space to where they ended up and then eventually you know as time went on you had aristotle uh began to go to egypt and retrieve some of the information from india from tibet and began to make his own deceptions based off of the tablets so you know that's why there is look, at the, look at the features though of traditional yeah. these pictures of traditional greek people do they not yeah. resemble an like a distant cousin? Can you not see how they're like distant? Co you can see you can start yeah. to see the more traditional white features popping through, but the darkness. Um, I know I have I have a, a little bit of Greek in me. Um, that's as my mother says. That's why I tan so well. But um, you can see that's when I pulled this picture up. I was like, oh my god, this picture compared to the pictures we were just seeing of the blonde Africans, they could be distant cousins. You can see right. the connection to me, right? Oh yeah, for sure. And, and what's what I found interesting, even more interesting, is you know you talk about the Greeks and you talk about Egypt, and then you know the home of the information, which is in India. You know, which is you know where the tablets and everything live. But what I found interesting, and and I mentioned it on the previous episode. But I think you'll find it just as interesting because I'm going to read it verbatim. It's their technology. Yeah. You know, it, it's how far along they were. I mean, not just in the cosmic sciences, but it, but in, in daily life. And at this particular time, there was a war and going on. So, you know, yeah, there was there was peace, but there was also war times. And I want to read this, this section to you where and this is in india so this is page uh, 203 where they talk about the naga empire and how it existed for approximately 35 3500 well 35,000 years ago and how the brahmins got the knowledge from naga so there was a lot of exchange of information during this time in part but what is Sorry, not that page. So one page one eighty nine is where I'm at is where I'm at, Bryce. And actually at one eighty nine first and then page two oh two. So all recordings related to these airships distinctly state that they were self moving and they were propelled themselves. In other words, they generated their own power as they flew along. They were independently all fuel, and it seems to me, in the face of this, all boasting, uh, were there about 15 to 20,000 years ago behind the times, dropping bombs from airships uh, that led us to where we are. And this was a war that was going on with uh, the the raw winds and so they had machine guns that sounded like thunder i mean you have this stuff that's going on and even goes on to say on page 202 uh one of the inventions that they as they talk about is one of the the rankings of the earliest biomedical teachings was man started from nothing Oh, did you? I think you paused. Man started from nothing, then became grass, then followed to a fish. From a fish, he became an amphibian. From the amphibian, he advanced to a reptile. From the reptile, he became a mammal. From the mammal, man was preceded. I think Hillis is frozen. I hope I'm not the one frozen. Let me text Hillis. It's Mercury retrograde, guys. So of course this might happen. Um, you're frozen on screen. How are you guys liking this, though? I'm. Um, if we cannot get Hillis back on, um, we can definitely do. Oh, let's see if he comes back on, you guys. He just signed off. So let's see. It's Mercury retrograde. So all these fun things happen in Mercury retrograde. But I'm just flawed. Fl uh, 
floored right now with what we're seeing with um, the Af people of African descent, or I mean, I don't know, whatever. Obviously, it's not African descent, but we're learning from you. So if you are somebody who is black, who's from Africa, who you've been taught is from African descent, like, what do you think about this? Because this gives a totally different history. Well, actually, it gives a different history for all of us because whether you're white or black or Asian or whatever, Native American, we all come from Mu. So, and then of course, as Hilla said, as we started to evolve and change, depending on where we were in the world and the food we were eating, and I probably I would I would guess the climate had a lot to do with it too, um, because I know that um, you know. Blue eyes, for example, like I'm blue eyed. All you guys have blue eyes. Apparently, they say that we are able to um, see in snow blindness. Like, like we are, we don't get snow blindness. So, um, which makes sense, right? Because we think of more blue eyed people coming from Northern Europe where there was more uh, of a need to survive in the snow. So, that might have evolved over time. I also, as I said earlier, do think that we not only have Mu, but we do have like extraterrestrial intervention. And I do sometimes think that things like blue eyes, green eyes come from other planets as well. So because um, we know that the Mew people had brown eyes and had um, brown hair. So is blonde hair. We see, we see black people in these islands who have natural blonde hair. So is this just an, an adapt is blonde hair just an adaptation of the environment or is blonde hair coming from the intervention of extraterrestrials like the palladians what do you guys think about that let me see um if Hellas is still and we're back we love a good mercury retrograde don't kill us we love a good mercury retrograde yeah we do and so <laughs> i just want to say that with, with everything that's happened and honestly i want to get my hands on the sacred writings of Mu. I really do. So if anyone's watching and knows how I can get my hand, because I want to study them because there's so much rich information here that I feel that uh, humanity can benefit from. I mean, there's so much. Yeah. I mean, there's so much truth. And then, you know, with the with you showing the, the people, those other cultures and, and how we look and, and people say, oh, we can't look like that. You know, uh, why is this? Why is that? And so there's, there's this rich, abundant information that, you know, that happened over 70,000 years ago. And it's, you know, still out there, but it's been rewritten and retouched and redone. And, and we've, been so to, we've all been lied to. We've all been lied to about. And, you know, it's interesting. I'm, I'm like lord about i don't know what i guess again as i said earlier hillis and i'm not i'm not even a black person but i just seeing these people from the the islands north of australia i that is wild to me and how beautiful yeah. is that like these black people with natural blonde hair how gorgeous like that's gorgeous um and i'm curious I know, like, that's why i miss my red hair <laughs> well you got some irish in you too don't you or some welsh yeah yeah, yeah. So that, but that makes you think like, I, as you were gone, as I was, you know, feeling the dead air when you were gone, I said, you know, does that, how does that, how do our audience feel about that? When we see these, these features, these genetic features that we, that we give to one particular race, like when you think of blonde hair, Hillis, do you think of a white person automatically? Like a white person yeah. on here. Yeah. But now we're seeing that's not the case. That there's actually also, and so like the 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 conventional science people have a lot of explaining to do because, you know, and and Hillis, like you said, this was hard for you to hear as a black person. How do you think our black friends watching are taking this, hearing that maybe Africa wasn't the first place where black people were living, but were they were living in these islands of Mew? How how did that? You said that that was hard, like that kind of like shocked you a little bit. How do you think our friends watching? Do you think it's gonna be shocking, or do you think people are gonna be? Easy well, to it yeah. might it might depend on the on the individual individual basis. Because for me, you know, with everything that I was taught about Africa, there's such a, a proudness about coming from the motherland, about coming from Africa. There's this there's this ingrained space of inheritance. And this is our land. This is where we come from. This is you know where we are. This is so it's it's a bad. And so growing up with that, but then what I feel helped me to digest this information is the fact 
that my mom was always the person who taught me to keep your options open. There's always more. Do your research, you know, study, do all these things. So it helped me just like, well, you know, be open to the possibility that Africa may not be it. But, you know, growing up, there was no other proof to refute that. Right. And that now was there, the there is proof. Wow. Now there is proof. Can't can't two things be true? This because it's the same thing with like your. Well, essentially, I mean, it is. Yeah, I like mean, was, who were the people that made Africa powerful? Exactly. The people that moved there, right? The people that moved there. Uh, exactly. The same thing exactly. with Europe. Who were the people that made Europe powerful? The white people who moved there from you. Like they all, you know, and that's and I think about right. that like as a as a white person, predominantly of European descent. Like we see all these different European countries that have their own specific culture, just like we see in Africa. But can two things be true? Can you be a, fr a proud French person, but also know that you orig originated from you with everyone else, right? And so, right, exactly, exactly. <laughs> and I want to show you guys this. This is on page 240. I finally found it. This is one of the things that, oh man, that talk about oh, the I'm Japanese. 240? 240. So, this is the Japanese flag, and this is the sun in the middle where it's now represented by all the the obviously there's more rays here but you can see that's definitely represented the representation of that and it says here that uh traditions exist saying that the some of the malay islands were peopled from the motherland a branch of the Kerswa mayans meaning that anyone who's left moved was mine so <laughs> we're Mayans. Um, we're all oh you disappeared. Oh, there you go. We're all we're all Mayans. Yeah. And so it even talks about, you know, how oh, this is interesting. So I forgot about this one. Yeah, so it also says uh one of the characters filings in the buried cities. So no. So yeah, so I mean honestly I would just urge you guys to go out and if you don't read any other books from James Churchward, read The Children of Moo and The Lost Conti Continent of Moo. Those were first two. Uh, because this will really give you some sense of where he was and what he was doing. And I'm actually looking for... Yes, here it is. So this is the the passage that I was referring to earlier on page 251 talking about Jesus and uh, the cosmic forces. I'm not going to read all of it because it's rather lengthy. I'll just read a little bit of it. And it says, in another monastery I found a recording stating that Jesus became the most proficient master that has ever been on earth. That's because he had 12 years to study with no distractions. Come on. <laughs> he didn't have TikTok to keep him distracted, did he? No, <laughs> or Instagram exactly. no, no, or no television. TikTok, no Netflix. And, and and he and he taught himself. I mean he had teachers, but from my from what I feel that he was also mostly self taught. But today the name Jesus is more revered in this monastery by any other sect of Christian priesthood, simply because the old monks knew him better. In addition to this record, I found that they had a legend about Jesus. The head of the monastery told me that a long time this legend was only oral. Then, to prevent being forgotten or altered, it was written down about 18 to 1900 years ago. This writing is now runs, and I quote, not that I'm quoting anything else because it's all I'm reading from the book, but it says, when Jesus was about to leave the monastery, a controversy arose between him and the masters on the subject of reincarnation. Jesus maintained that the sacred writings, the sacred inspired writings of the motherland stated that it was not the material body of man that was reincarnated out of the original atoms that formed his previous material body. Yep. But the soul or spirit only was reincarnated. And the masters maintained that it was both the soul and the previous material body that was reincarnated, and that the identical atoms of the old body were used over in the new succeeding one. And this just goes on 
to say that how Jesus, you know, deciphered information, how he translated the information, and how he was aware of the cosmic forces and the life force energy, and how I want to read it verbatim about his miracle of walking on the water. Ah. Yes, my son, the power over which you call gravity, this is on page 250. Yes, my son, the power that over which you call gravity, he can ride, raise his vibrations, put forth a force above the Earth's cold magnetic force and nullify its effects. It is only this force which draws and anchors him to the ground. When the magnetic force is nullified, a man's body can, a uh, man's body being matter and matter in itself having no weight enables him to raise his body and float through the air and walk float over water as on land weight measures the degree of attraction and pull the magnetic force and i'm just going to leave it at that because this really is a good lead up into the next section which you know is the cosmic forces and i tell you they were on or something. <laughs> it's so crazy, Hillis. I'm gonna I, I like literally do like this is all in the yoga sutras. So all this it's the same it's so it makes me think more about Patanjali because he talks about the same thing about like Jesus was having an argument like this. The body is not and that's what I tell people all the time. Like Patanjali says in the Yoga Sutras that man suffers because we think our body is us. When your soul is not your your body is just a creation of your soul. It's it's myth. Yeah. You know, and I think, you know, we, since we're just talking about race, my my viewpoint is that we've reincarnated is almost every race. Like, we've been... I know, you know I have. I the mean, Hillis has been a white princess sitting in a, callus, ca a castle, guys. I've been a black man sitting in Africa. So have you all, you know? All right, so, and just, to, and just to, 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 to confirm that, you know, I was told that in my most recent previous incarnation i was a six foot tall white man in hollywood i was a hollywood actor in my last life i didn't i didn't i didn't do much you know well actually i'm not going to reveal that actor's name that's for another day or another show but uh, well but that's the thing and people ask me hills about blood like blood types all the time so i do a lot on blood types you guys blood your blood your blood type is part of your body so you're gonna have different blood types depending on the life and, and it's all a refinement of your soul right so like a blood has a different personality trait b's o's i'm an o it's all depending on what your soul the infinite wisdom of your soul wants to learn and refine itself so it picks different races different jobs different yeah, genders to, exactly to experience, you know but i can definitely say it's easier being a man than a woman I, that's for sure i can well i think i've been a woman a lot because i'm i define but i agree with that for sure i Same here uh, I mean, yeah. what is so being um if you don't mind me asking Helen, i can cut this out if you being a, a, a gay man how is that compared to being like a straight man or a straight woman as far as like friction honestly i don't i don't think that there really is much of a difference for me because you know everybody has their quirks everybody has their their nuances that make them them you know yeah. And when I was growing up, I dated girls. I mean, that's what I knew. I mean, I dated girls up until like my sophomore, junior year of high school. Then I'm like, You're like oh. oh. Then I then I had like this uh, girl stalk me in my junior year. You know, she was a senior, I was a junior. She was stalking me. I'm like, okay, I think that's it. I'm kind of done with girls. But you know. It, you know, I, I have appreciation for the female form. Don't get me wrong. I appreciate the female form and all that it is. But being, you know, a gay man, you know, I don't, honestly, I don't feel it's any different because, you know, when I sat in plant medicine circles with obviously straight people, yep. there's this one commonality and that's the energy, the energy of love, the energy of space, all of that, Yep. you know, it, you know, bypasses everything else. I mean, it's, it's, it's who you are. Yeah. And so if you can't see past this into someone's soul to know who they are, 
Nothing, yeah. nothing else really matters. I mean, yeah, you have your own shit to deal with, so fucking deal with it. Excuse yeah, me, I, but, you know, I love <laughs> it, that, and that's actually traditional spirituality is like is like fucking deal with it. Like that's what it is, and it's interesting. You know, we because we we are like you know as a straight woman. I can say, okay, even with like your soul creating your Shakti, your experience to refine, like I crave the essence of a man. And so what are there? There's lessons for me as a soul to learn through that experience. Right. And I've listened, I've gone through trauma therapy, all that kind of stuff. And I knew I was, I had reached a level of certain health when I attracted a healthy partner, you know, but if I yeah. was a lesbian, that would be a different energy. So it's, it's like you are, you're constantly, your soul is constantly on this state of refining itself. And yeah. so every experience is just a different experience for the ultimate experience. And at the end of the day, that's why I yeah. would laugh like, it doesn't matter what the whole motherland is because we're all from the same cosmic force. We all come yeah. from the same force. All and you know, and you, and you mentioned something real interesting. And so, you know, part of my personal story is that, you know, I thought I was gay because I didn't have a father growing up. Bullshit. No, that wasn't why. It was because it was by design. I chose this experience so you know, to, yeah. to have this. And so, you know, when you're growing up as a kid and any teenager who's watching, you know, or parent of a teenager who's watching, you know, this is their experience. Yes, you're there to guide them. And, you know, I had all these thoughts, these questions, these ideas of of what it meant to be gay or what it meant to like a guy or to have affectionate feelings or lustful feelings for a guy. And, you know, growing up Catholic school, Catholic church, Catholic church, all this stuff, it wasn't natural, but now today is this more accepted. Oh, absolutely, it's, yeah. And so, you know, my experience, you know, allowed me to be this person sitting in front of you, more accepted, more tolerable, but still don't take no shit from nobody. Exactly. <laughs> you know, I tell my students all the time, listen, every group of people, so if you put people in groups, you're always going to have assholes and you're always going to have good people. It does not matter what your race is. It doesn't matter what your sexuality is. It doesn't matter what your political affiliation is. If you're an asshole, you're an asshole. You're an asshole. <laughs> right? It doesn't matter. Like, you're not going to virtue signal your way into ascension by being, you know, by having certain labels, you know? Yeah. And likewise, if you're a good person with a good heart and you're constantly, you're self-aware and you're constantly working on yourself and yeah. you're the best for other people... Likewise, it doesn't matter. Like it really, it, no, does, it doesn't. It doesn't matter. And so, and that's what I actually feel, Hillis. That's the thing that gets me so excited about one of my really good friends. One of my best friends here in Atlanta is a black woman, and I know she's very private. Mm -hmm. so I'm not gonna. And we talk about all the this stuff a lot because we're both like like you and me, Hillis. Like she's a. Weird you have woman. to tell this. So you got to share this episode with her. Oh, I will. I will totally. Oh, she watches. Her husband calls it my TV show. Her husband was like, you know, my Bryce's TV show. It's like I was watching Bryce's TV show today. But anyway. <laughs> We are, we're both like super, my friend and I, you know, she's a black woman. I'm a white woman. We're both O negative. Like we both, we have a lot in common, but we're different races. Yeah. We talk about this stuff all the time, how ridiculous it is. Cause we're both weird weirdos. And we talk about ghosts, yeah. and like weird stuff all the time. And I, I honestly think, you know, we talk about how much the powers that be, we'll say the Aluma Shmati, cause we can't see the full word yeah, yeah, yeah. here on YouTube have tried to divide us. Cause they want that chaos. They want that fear. You know, that's what they feed off of. But I think stuff like this is what's going to actually, like, once this gets into people's... Oh, yeah, it has to. It, yeah, it has to. It has to. And that's part, of, actually, that's part of my purpose. You know, that's part of, I want to bring this information out. And, you know, one of the things I want to share, too, from a personal perspective, you know, after sitting in many plant medicine ceremonies, and one of my shamans who I sat with, you know, at the end of a particular medicine ceremony, he comes to me and says, like, yeah, you are a two-spirited person. I'm like, oh, okay, well, that's good to know. And later I found out what that meant, meaning that, you know, embodying both male and female energies. Yep. And, and, it's a, and it's in perfect harmony and balance. And what I find fascinating is that, you know, if you look in the animal kingdom and if you look at, you know, uh, indigenous cultures, especially in Africa, we have it all backwards. Men are the ones supposed to be wearing the makeup. Men are supposed to be the one wearing the heels. Because, I mean... Men in the uh, heels. He, George Washington wore heels. Well, yeah. Well, yeah but, but, yeah, but you, but you get the gist of what I'm saying. The peacocks? Yeah, because, yeah, the, the peacocks. Pretty peacocks are males. Exactly. The, 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 the most fabulous, the most uh, 
uh, I can't even think of one, but you know, most fabulous a extras uh, animals. Say. Yeah, in the animal kingdom, are males because it is the female that has to choose. It's like, do I want you? Do I want to have babies with you? Are you going to give me the best looking babies? Are you going to give me this? So it's in that space. And so when you look at that, it's like, how do we get it backwards? How did we now in humanity get it backwards? I, this is the, the girl, the ladies in the, in the audience will understand this when you're so some women can feel themselves ovulating. I cannot feel myself ovulating, but I know, especially when I was single, I knew when I was ovulating because my attraction would change. So all of a sudden I would be attracted to men that look super responsible. Like I find myself retracted, attracted to men that look like they were accountants. And I'm a girl. I mean, you know, my boyfriend, he's covered in tattoos. Like, I like yeah, the yeah, bad yeah. boys, the fringe guys. But all of a sudden, like, two days a month, I would really want a nerd. Like, I would. <laughs> and, but think about Nothing that. Like, that. The, think about that, like, like scientifically. I'm, I'm ovulating and, like, this man looks responsible, right? So he's going to, you know, that's the, that's the natural. So you say the, the women, the male, the females in, the, in nature are picking a man it's the same thing well, even, in, even in in the indigenous tribes i think if there's one type particular in africa where they have this dance and this ritual and that they do you know where they adorn themselves in color and makeup and and all of this and and whoever does whatever i forget what it is exactly but it's it's most indigenous tribes that follow this ritual this fashion and it's because it's it it gives them the most virility, the most vital energy. So it's in that respect in which we cultivate. So when you think about it, you know, in terms of evolution of our race from mood, if you think of it in terms of, of how indigenous uh, patterns work in terms of mating, then they only chose the more uh, virile men, the more strong men, the or the prettiest man, or the one, one, or one who was in balance. When you think of it that way, this is how we allowed ourselves to evolve. Right. And so, which is why you know, you know, the the Negro or the Negroid, as James put it in his book, you know, was some of the more dominant. Yeah, that makes so, sense. You know, it makes total sense. It's um. It's interesting. It's all fascinating. And it's, I cannot wait to hear what our audience has to say as well. Ladies, yeah, and I can't wait to dig into the cosmic forces. Me too. That, that's what I really dig. I could talk about spirituality all day. I could talk about the yin and the yang, the left and the right nostril, feminine, masculine, Shiva, Shakti all, all day long. I love it. I love, that's why I went to India and lived there for a while because I love this shit. So yeah. it's just, it just feels true. Like it feels like there's a, there's a solid truth there. And yeah. I, I guess what we've learned is like, ladies, you heard it here. Your man better be dressing up for you. Your man better be doing everything to, you know, and I actually, I mean, back when I used to date men who were eyeliner, you know, I love what I love when men put eyeliner on, you know, and, and so there is, there is, that's going to start some conspiracies. I know on the internet, but you know, it's the rock and roll <laughs> guys, the glam, think about glam rock of the eighties, the big hair, you know, and the guy liner and, you know, there is some, 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 some truth to that. So, you know, it's just this human experience as Ram Dass would say, it's interesting. It's interesting. Yeah. It's just interesting. Yeah. So, yeah. well, I cannot wait to go deeper into this with you, Hillis. And I cannot wait. I want to hear all of our friends. Again, be careful with specific trigger words, guys. You guys know what those words are because we are definitely challenging this episode. We're challenging the establishment. I think we're doing a good job playing on the, the line of, Hey, let's look at this book versus like, you know, with some other, you know, yeah. we definitely we're in a battle right now between as Jessica pointed <laughs> out, right? She pointed that out too in her remote viewing. So yeah. anyway, you guys, but anyway, I can't wait to hear everybody's thoughts. Please, I'm gonna have all of Hillis's links. He will have this episode as well on his channel, but I'm gonna have all of Hillis's links in the description box below. If you are not subscribed to Hillis's channel, please make sure to subscribe. We talk about controversial things, so make sure that you are, you know, doing what you can to put yeah. videos out too. I'm also yeah, because on my channel, I'm also diving deep into the symbology of it, like doing a lot of people understand the meaning of the heritage alphabet of Moose. So that would be a And your Instagram, too. I've been noticing. I'll put his Instagram down, too, guys, because he's doing oh, yeah. shorts, too, on the Instagram. And sometimes those shorts are great because it's just enough. It's a nugget of information that you can kind of chew on for the day. So it's not super overwhelming. So Like this. <laughs> 
Yeah, like this, this. Well, get the book too, guys. So any yeah. party words, Hillis, for our friends watching? Oh. Our, the Mayans, our friends, our Mayans, the children of <laughs> Know who you are and know where you come from. And know your neighbor comes from the same place, so. <laughs> All right, we'll talk to you soon. Bye, everybody.